Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Murat Yeşil, and I am the moderator of this event, organized by Istanbul Commerce University. Today's guest speaker is a distinguished scholar, Dr. Detlev Quinton. Dr. Quinton will give you a speech titled Transcultural Kalila Vadimma, The Fable of the Ring Door. But before that, let me tell you a few words about Dr. Quinton. Dr. Quinton is assistant professor at Turkish German University, where he teaches cultural history, heritage, and museum studies. At Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakıf University of Istanbul, <clears throat> he had been teaching history of science between the years 2013 and 2019. He was director for training and development at the professor Dr. Fuat Sezgin Research Foundation for, for the history of science in Islam, uh, 2011 to 2019. He was also an editorial board member of Islamic philosophy and occidental phenomenology in, in dialogue. After studying international economics, and political sciences in Bremen, Arabic and Oriental studies in Hamburg, Leipzig. He graduated with a PhD in history from Bremen University. His dissertation project focused on the Rasal Ikwan as Safa while researching the treaties in, long, in a long-term historical context of intellectual, and history of science before and during the Abbasid Caliphate. His current main research interests are the, are the history of geography, cartography, travel writings, and ethics of cross-cultural understanding. Dr. Quinton will take it from here. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Detlev Quinton. Welcome, Dr. Quinton. We are listening to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Murat Hodja, for this uh, friendly, kind introduction. Um, and thank you to Tijaret <coughs> University for inviting me. It is a pleasure for me uh, to present today on the fable of the ring dove. Kalila Wadimna as a transcultural travel of especially ethics. Mm, I mean, we share one globe, we share one <clears throat> time, so we share one space, one time, and it is not separable. It's not possible to separate the world we are living in, and it is also not uh, possible to separate time. So knowledge traveled since human beingness uh, entered life, <laughs> uh, traveled over the globe continuously, and these travels become just quicker and quicker as we can faster and faster, <laughs> as we can see, as we are communicating nowadays and just in the moment, digital. So we can be in different places at different times. Um, it became faster. But in these times, I will speak with you or I will speak about, um, I mean, not only knowledge, the travel of knowledge took a long, long time, but even scholars sometimes traveled by foot from one university to another, and it might have taken sometimes years to reach one place uh, where there was a wish uh, to study and to learn. So digitalization nowadays fastens uh, the travel of knowledge of ideas and so on, but the character stayed the same. So knowledge is universal 
And knowledge is not just, let's say, pure knowledge. Knowledge is embedded into ethics, akhlaq in Arabic. You have the same term in Turkish. I think most of you probably know Kalile Bedimne, as it is also part of the Turkish earlier Ottoman and yeah, the canon of literature. And I will speak about this fable um, historically. So I will historicize the fable and I'm following a universalistic approach, which means um, to follow history as a long time history in the unity of space and time. And I will first go to the genesis, so far as we know about it, to the genesis of this fable, or more especially a certain part of the fable. Kalila Vedimne, Kalila Wadimna, Kalila Entimna, it is a larger collection of different fables. And I will speak on the fable of the ring dove. Um, so, uh, Dr. Us... Quintern, yes. uh, may I say a couple of words uh, before you uh, go on further? Um, I want to emphasize, uh, sorry for interrupting you. But I no problem. Uh, the significance of this topic on uh, shaping our culture. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, for taking the time to gather with us today. Uh, I have always been a fan of travel uh, fables uh, and I love them for their timelessness and the um, uh, witty lessons they offer. Uh, I found your topic absolutely fascinating because it represents a blending of Persian and Arabic cultures inspiring numerous um, academic scholars and thus enriching the uh, Muslim intercultural world. Kelile Vadimna, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm sorry if I do any uh, mispronunciation, but it represents an early influence on uh, our uh, literary tradition. So uh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, uh, but before I carry myself any further, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you uh, to welcome you and thank you for gathering with us today. No, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. So, and I will go back. So as I told you, I fo I'm following this, let's say universalistic uh, approach, which means to, I mean, the history of humankind and the history of literature um, did not start probably with written sources. But as you know, the earliest written sources we have um, on the one hand in the Mesopotamia, uh, Euphrat, Tigris, and Sumer. And on the other hand, it is what is nowadays called Old Egypt. <laughs> so the Egyptian dynasty starting from around 3000 BC. So I want to go to the genesis historically of Kalila Vedimna, uh, Kalila Wadimna. And we have one ostrakon, it is a ceramic piece, colored, painted in the um, museum in Berlin, in the State Museum, Egypt, uh, Egyptology or Egyptian Museum and the collection of Papyri. And this ostragon, as you can see on the, on the, on the screen, shows us a scenery from a collection of fables from the 12th century BC, 12th century BC. And it shows us two figures on the, yeah, on the level uh, beneath level. On the right side, uh, you have a kind, it is a kind of monkey uh, figure. And on the left side, you do have a kind, it is a lion. So what happened? Uh, why this, um, it is on the left side, it is um, Tefnut. Tefnut, she was the son, no, she was the daughter of the goodness, goddess of the sun, and she left her home 
somehow to discover the world. I do not want to go into detail. So she left and she did not return. So the family uh, were, of course, the, let's say, yeah, the family was, of course, scared. Where did the daughter go? As she did go into the desert, especially. So leaving home. And what did they send? They sent to Tefnut, the deity or the daughter of the deity, um, they sent a storyteller, which is in Arabic, it is Hakawati nowadays. I mean, you have also in the old Kabehane, you have these tradition of storytelling. Uh, in Arabic, we say Hakawati, it is a storyteller. Um, you had it also a long time. And similarly to this Hakawati storyteller, thought, which is the, um, he was a kind of messenger of God, uh, sent to bring Tefnut back to home. <clears throat> so what did her, what did thought, thought was the deity and the symbol um, for, in old Egypt for wisdom, for, yeah, mainly wisdom, um, and science and epistemology somehow. Um, he told her stories to bring her back. So he told her stories about, I mean, yeah, how dangerous is the world. I will not go into detail. But he also told Tefnut a story about a lion who crossed the desert and who wanted to get knowledge about human being. He did never met humans, human beingness uh, during his time. So he crossed the desert, coming often from the south of Egypt into the Nile Delta in order to find humans. And interestingly, on the way uh, crossing the desert, he met, for example, a donkey, uh, which is very badly treated and by human beings, by humans. And he met several animals who are not treated well, let's say. They are somehow tortured and <laughs> somehow, yeah, not well treated. So he wondered what and what happened? Who are these human beings treating uh, other animals so badly? And then at a certain point, he met a small mouse, uh, mouse. And I mean, he wondered the mouse was running under his feet. And he was just at the moment, he wanted to take the mouse and eat the mouse away somehow. But then the mouse said, don't do this. I mean, if you do eat me, you won't be satisfied. Your stomach will not be filled. I'm such a small uh, mouse, so don't do this. It makes no sense. And maybe in the future, I might be of help for you. I might be helpful for you. So the lion did think a little bit about it. And he said, oh, of course, why should I eat this small mouse? I won't be <laughs> satisfied. And he let her go away. He let her run away. So he continued his travel into humans, into villages. He wanted to, uh, to reach these places. And then suddenly, while continuing his walk, he did fell into a trap. And this trap was, um, I mean, it was a hole, you know, these traps to catch animals, wild animals. So it is a hole and a net, and he was caught in the net, the lion. And I mean, you have this contradiction. The mouse is the smallest animal, weak, while the lion is shown very often as the king of the animals. Uh, so the lion, the king of the animals, was trapped. What happened? 
the small mouse did come and she did free him by nagging, by, by somehow eating the net away. So the small mouse helped the lion to be freed out of the trap which human beingness did yeah, uh, bring him into. So this shows that the small mouse can be much stronger or of much more help than to eat the mouse. Um, and they became friends. The mouse and the lion became friend and he carried the mouse away. So they became friends carrying them away. They went into the desert and the lion was not anymore interested in meeting human beings. Um, this is the genesis of what later became also the fable of the ring dove as a part of Kalile Vedimne. So I go to the second one. So very often, I mean, we don't know, maybe this fable existed already as an oral tradition for a longer time and then it was written down. We find an oral tradition in Sudan, which continued. So in Sudan, we have an oral, also different tradition, which was documented by an ethnographer, Frobenius. He collected this fable from an oral tradition. And then we do have different arrows from the 12th century BC in old Egypt. One arrow goes to what we call Greek antiquity. So we have a small fragment uh, from the first century AC, Papyrus Rulans, which gives us and uh, documented a small fragment in the collection of fables, which later became the fables of Aesop, uh, especially for the European uh, fable traditions. This is very important. But we do also have another, let's say, another path of traveling to India um, in the Pancha Tantra, uh, in the collection of these fables. There's still a discussion going on to date exactly the fable, um, but it seems to be fifth, sixth or fifth to seventh century AC. And we have the same motive as we did have, as we could follow in the old Egyptian fable tradition or in the old Egyptian fable with Tefnut and Thot and the lion and the mouse we do now have a kind of inculturation in India, in the Indian fable, as it is over, also in India, it is not a lion which is caught into the trap. It is an, does anybody have an idea? It is another animal who might have an idea. Uh, if you think about strong uh, animals in India, especially, uh, what what animal would come to your idea? Uh, does you have an idea? Does anybody have an idea? <laughs> elephant? It is the elephant, right. Mm. So we have this, let's say, inculturation. The strong animal, the elephant, also is caught in a trap and he's also freed by a mouse. So you have the same motives, the same, the small and weak animal uh, rescues the strong and normally uh, invincible, <laughs> like the elephant or like before the lion. So freeing the elephant out of the human trap. Um, we have continuities. I mean, there are in the history of literature some discussions also, which might, in which ways it goes. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit, or I wanted to introduce to you these traces, hmm, fragments, 
um, as documenting this favor. It most probably then continued to Persia, into Middle Persian, into Pahlavi, which is the Middle Persian uh, language. And from there, the Faber traveled to Ibn Muqaffa. Ibn Muqaffa, I mean, he lived around the founding period of the Abbasid Caliph, Caliphate. So it was founded in between 700, around 752, a little bit later. It took a longer time, of course, to establish this um, later metropolis and the center of the Abbasid Caliphate based on a smaller uh, former Persian city, Kitsipion. And Ibn Muqaffa, I mean, yeah, he did die very young. He was executed, not clearly. I mean, also there's historical research going on, but he adapted this fable. So there's a discussion. One, let's say one pass of adoption might come from India. And I think so. Other scholars say he adapted it from Aramaic, from Syria, Syrian languages. But that is not the question. It is a more philological or linguistical, philological uh, question. I want to speak about the continuation of the motives. So we have the motive and the ethics of Kalila Wadimna. Um, we have one of the oldest of the oldest uh, so far surviving manuscript um, is in Munich in the Bavarian State Library. It is one also drawn like the one in Oxford Baudelaire Library. Probably it is the same miniature painting school. We have a certain school at this period uh, in the 13th century, miniature painting, which you can see in the using of colors, the forms of the leaves and so on. It was the early miniature painting school. And the oldest manuscript we do have is in Munich. We have shown this once in a museum in Oldenburg. It's a beautiful manuscript and there should be one day also kind of facsimile, I think should be done of this uh, beautiful favor. So you might know, or probably you know, or some, or maybe partly you know, Kelile Vedimne. I mean, these are two shekels. Shekel, I mean, what is a shekel? I mean, shekel, yes, it is a Kupek Gibi, Bir Aiwan, living. I don't know whether we do have it in Turkey, uh, shekels. Do we have shekels in Turkey? No. It is a kind of wild dog, but it looks a little bit scary it has such a big mouse and a big <laughs> strong you are not talking about shekels right yes do they yeah do they exist in turkey just i wanted to know uh, honey it's called honey in english i guess uh but yeah they, it exists of course <laughs> yeah uh -huh. <laughs> um, okay so kalida vedimna you have a good shekel it's not a high end Shekel is a bit different. It's a stronger one. The hyena is also dangerous and, but yeah, not so important. This, maybe the, the image looks more than a hyena, but the shekel is, you have a good one and a bad one. What does the bad one do? Um, it is, uh, it is dimne. So there was a friendship between the lion and uh, the ox. And they were very good friends. And um, Dimne became somehow, it became, yeah, it didn't like this friendship. It became jealous. Or he became jealous. So he insinuated a, a quarrel between the two friends, between the ox and the lion. What finally happened? The lion killed his friend, the ox because yeah, Dimna somehow 
succeeded to bring them against each other. So, mm, I mean, finally also Dimne did not survive this, but this introducing study, it is also ethical. What is, yeah, ethically, what is friendship? What is trust? How friendship and trust can be brought out or destroyed somehow. This is, um, yeah, the core or the, let's say the opening story of Kalila Vedimne. But we do have here, we have another, uh, yeah, this is this uh, Munich, Munich uh, manuscript. Um, yeah, you can see the same school of miniature painting, especially the leaves, the colors of this tree in the background. And of course you can see it along the uh, calligraphy, how it is written. Uh, Shanzaba, it is the ox and it is in this scenery killed by the lion. Um, so I now want to come to this motive that we do find already, uh, the ethical motive, which we did find already in the old Egyptian motive, the lion and the mouse. Then in India, the elephant and the mouse, the mouse liberating the elephant out of the human trap. Now we have the same motive and you can see this here in the, in the miniature painting. You have doves. I mean, the story starts like this. Doves. Um, dove, how do you call do dove? Sometimes I'm thinking, I forgot at the moment. Um, Efendim? Güvercin. Güvercin. Oh. Evet, güvercin. <laughs> evet, Dov, güvercin. Güvercin değil, kumru. On, kumru galiba, dove değil mi? Uh, I think... Oh, pigeon, pigeon, evet. Pigeon. Galiba kumru. Uh -huh. And there are different kinds of, I mean, also it's a kind, what is very beautiful, you always do learn something a little bit about zoology also. I mean, pigeon and um, doves and what are the different, so there are sometimes slight differences and there's a, in the fable, there is a queen uh, of the pigeons and th this is a ring dove. It's a special, special. Maybe it's also related to the motive in uh, Nuh, Noah, you know, bringing the olive, <laughs> olive tree, showing that there's land uh, somehow. So these doves or these pigeons were caught also in a net. So there was a hunter and he spread red berries and the doves were attracted by the red berries and they were caught into a net. Then you can see on the top of this, yeah, not top, it's not a big, uh, big uh, tree, but you can see the raven and the raven is observing a certain scenery. Um, mm, yeah, I have to tell you this before, this is another one, I mean, there's a very nice and beautiful scenery in the beginning of this sequence of the fable of the ring dove. So the doves are all caught in the net. Hmm? And then the ring dove says, if we now start to fly up, everybody wants to get out and karabalik huh? somehow, uh, we won't succeed if everybody starts to try to free him or herself by its own, then we won't succeed. What we have to do is we have to fly up all at once, all at once. So let's try this. And the dove succeeded to fly up at the same moment. Maybe I have another one here. You can see the scenery, huh? the doves, fly up when the, when the hunter approaches <laughs> at the same time. Here we have it also in this uh, Persian 
miniature painting. So the hunter wondered, the doves are flying away with his uh, net. So they freed themselves somehow uh, from the greed of the hunter, let's say, and they did fly to a friend. And the friend is who can uh, recognize, who can see this, the friend also is a mouse. It's sometimes, yeah, in this case, it should be a mouse. And the raven on the top is following the story and is following this process. And the mouse also starts to, to free the doves out of the net. And interestingly is also, this is also ethically very nice, nicely, because the ring dove was the friend of the mouse. <laughs> so, and the ring dove said, don't start to free me firstly, because we are friends, you know me, start with the other ones. So the mouse started with the other ones to free the doves, not the ring doves or the pigeons, not the ring doves. And finally, they were all freed. Hmm? The raven has seen this and he said, oh, what is this? I also want to have the mouse as a friend. <laughs> so he approached the mouse, mouse's house, but of course the mouse hid it and he had to convince the mouse to, yeah, because he said, what we should do, also human, we are not safe anywhere. We are not safe anywhere. We have to hide somehow. The hunters are everywhere and we have to go far away on a, he said, I have a friend, another friend, it's a turtle living on a small pond, a small lake, maybe, a pond and he took the mouse into his uh, the mouse into his the mouse into his mouth <laughs> and flew away with the mouse to the friends where yeah the, there was the turtle and I mean the story continues now in this way so the hunter continues to hunt um, maybe I show you this one here yeah this is the old story of I mean, the first part, uh, this is the Ringdorf fable. So um, the animals somehow succeed to find, let's say exile or no, it's not an exile because the hunter is everywhere. He comes also to all these places where they feel secure. So for example, later then, when the mouse, the raven and the turtle were on the small pond, they could observe a gazelle, a razal, a razal, gazelle. It's, uh, yeah, you know this animal, gazelle. And um, also it was hunted by the, hunted by the hunter. <laughs> so they also succeeded then to liberate the gazelle. And finally, what happens is um, that while the animals always were cooperating, you know, every animal has a specific um, yeah, capacity, a specific, uh, yes, you could say capacity, for example. I mean, let's say, um, the mouse is small, but can move easily, hide itself. The raven can fly, uh, the turtle and so on. They always cooperate. I mean, they give a good example for the human. If you cooperate, um, the hand, hunter has no chance to catch you. And this happens finally because um, the hunter gets crazy. He thinks in these forests and these regions where the animal live in a cooperative way, there must be jinns <laughs> somehow. So he became crazy and he left this region. And from then onwards, the animals lived in peace. Uh, and yes, in peace and in harmony, they were not hunted anymore. 
And yeah, this is, um, we have in German always the saying, das ist die Moral der Geschichte. It's a moral of this uh, story, the ethical, that animals give an example to the human being. Why the human being normally is endowed with equipped, you also could say, with reason, reason and intelligence, he should be more cooperative than animals. But in this case, it is the contrary. So the animals are more wise while cooperating than the human beings. I think it is a beautiful ethical motive also, and probably also interesting in the context of this, I mean, animal ethics and post-human studies and so on. So we have always to ask ourselves, what is life? Is there the animal here, the human being, there the plant? I do think that this Aristotelian lettering, the high recusation of life that you have on the bottom, the plant, then you have the animal, then you have the human being. This is a verticalization of life, which is not in accordance and in harmony to the horizontal uh, dimension to the communicative um, and interacting of life. So there's not here the tree, there's the human, there is a stone and so on. So life is communicating in every moment of its beingness. It is oneness and communication. This uh, fable shows this also very well. And it shows us also that to be intelligent and to be reasonable is not sufficient in order to be human. So knowledge has to be embedded into um, ethics, into akhlaq. Huh? That is very important. If it is not embedded into ethics, then human knowledge is dehumanized. So I just, I mean, it would be another topic to speak also about um, the miniature art. I mean, we have here these uh, 16th century Persian miniatures. There is a certain language also in the, in the, yeah, in the painting, of course, I mean, it is influenced somehow by Chinese, sometimes Japanese motifs. Also, we do have this transculturality. And very often in the Persian tradition of miniature painting, uh, the frame is broken. I find this very interesting. Here, for example, you also can see uh, the doves get out of the frame. Pigeons, hmm? they break out of the frame. That is a symbol and it tells us about that paintings are two dimensional, it's an illusion. And they did break this illusion by breaking the frame of the image to show a, a, a painting is always somehow like virtuality, it's an illusion of reality, it's not reality. Very nicely, that would be another uh, topic. I don't want to speak about it as I do not have so much time anymore. I just want to give you the last or give you a short idea about the latest travel. I mean, Kalila Vedimne were based on the uh, version of Ibn al Muqaffa, mainly 13th century. It was translated into, into old Spanish. We have Old Spanish, I mean, we have an in-between as in Al-Andalus long time was spoken Arabic and then Spanish came up and we have certain developments from Arabic also to Spanish. Um, and interestingly, yes, there's a translation into Old Spanish during the time around 1264-65, it is the time of Alfon Alfonso el Sabio, Alfonso Wise. He was a very tolerant king and he always brought together teams of Muslims, Christians, 
Jews and uh, they formed teams uh, to work scientifically. Very important for the European history, in my opinion. Uh, so old Spanish translation, then later Latin translation, and also Hebrew translation. So this fable somehow was adapted by uh, languages around the Mediterranean. Um, this one is from the 1450s, a beautiful manuscript in, it is in Heidelberg at the moment. And even the miniature paintings were adapted. Huh? It is written in a certain, let's say, stage of German, not any more Latin, but uh, yeah, it is a certain stage of early German. And the scenery is, you are acquainted with this uh, scenery. Yes, and finally, I did do a children book uh, together with an artist living now in Norway. So she did do the, let's say, modern uh, miniature painting. And yeah, I think I should conclude here at this point. And yeah, thank you for your awareness, concentration, and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Clinton. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're coming to the question and answer part of our event. Uh, if you have questions, please, the stage is yours. If no one has a question, I can ask one. Yes, please. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was just wondering uh, if you know uh, any specific Turkish literature, uh, like manuals, uh, fables, uh, romances, um, you know, tales, which can be said to be influenced by uh, Kalile and Dimne. Like, is there any specific literature? Oh, a bit difficult for me because honestly spoken, I did not deeply study so far uh, Turkish literature. I know that Kalida Vedimne, they, it was translated. I do not know whether it, uh, whether it existed during the Ottoman period. I don't know whether it was part of the, let's say, literature canon. I don't know. Do you know this maybe? I, I I just, because I'm so into fables, that's why I know just a little bit, a tiny bit, nothing too much, but I know that, uh, what was it called? Humayuname, yeah. I don't know if I'm uh, misspelling it again. Sorry uh -huh. if I'm uh, misspelling. No. Anyway, Humayuname, which was devoted to uh, Sultan Suleiman, uh, the Magnificent, I guess. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was translated into Turkish. It was translated, it has many incarnations. And um, that's why um, I said, you know, like, because it has, it shaped our culture too. Uh, it shaped our uh, literary tradition. Um, so that's why I was thinking, because we have uh, Miss TV and, you know, like yes. other uh, literature, uh, they don't, of course, portray, um, the, the depictions uh, as vividly, but um, they do use, um, you know, like speech, uh, they do use fables, they do use that kind of style in their writing. So that's why I thought maybe, you know, there's a you know specific literature that yeah. might be under this influence. Yes, no, that's very interesting. I will look at Humaname. I did not specifically study it. I mean, a colleague, she is translating the poems uh, especially written from Hürrem Sultane to uh, Suleiman, there are a lot of it. But that's another poetically field. I don't know these human. I have to study it. I will look at this. I mean, it is very interesting. Um, there are some studies also on the travel of certain motives. And I can imagine, as I mean, 
you have from Baghdad and you have the Seljuk period, you have Maslavi. I can imagine that there are several, let's say, uh, common overlacing and travelings. But I have to study this, honestly spoken. I, I'm very <laughs> much interested you. in it. I'm very Thank much you. interested. Uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, questions? No more questions? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Clinton and all participants. Uh, uh, we, uh, we wish to see you at another event. Yes. Goodbye. Mm, thank you very much. I hope to join you one another time and Thank you, Oja. Let me stay in contact. Bende chok teshikuderim. Be mutluku yakin zaman yini dan gurishus. Inshallah. 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 I hope. Haben Sie herzlichen Dank, Herr Quintan. Ja, vielen Dank und Ihnen noch ein schönes Wochenende. Ja, den Vortrag haben einige Studenten auf YouTube angesehen, ja? Und die können Sie auch mal noch anschauen. Ich werde Ihnen den Link noch schicken. Den Link schicken. Sehr schön, da freue ich mich. Okay. Herzlichen ja. Dank. Herzlichen Wir bedanken Dank. uns. Dankeschön. Okay. Dankeschön. Tschüss. Tschüss. Çok teşekkürler Murat Hocam. Ayşe Hocam. Size de teşekkürler. Sağ olun. Teşekkürler Hocam. Çok çok yararlandık. Ufuk açıcı oldu. Teşekkürler. Evet.